It's five o'clock and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I don't see any elected officials out, out there. If you are and I don't see you, please raise your hand. All righty. Uh, before we met here, I want you to know that the board met with representatives from the law department in executive session and Mr. Mr. Dupler, for the benefit of the members of the public, um, I want you just to explain about that meeting, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we met for, for a very short executive session regarding one case. Um, executive session is the only time that the board is able to, to meet in private for that specific purpose, and that specific purpose is to discuss uh, pending and uh, potential uh, litigation with the law department. That's all that was discussed, and the board members are not allowed to deliberate or d discuss anything amongst themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Having that out of the way, we'll begin with our Pledge of Allegiance with Mr. McMillan. Please face the flag and salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Also, for the uh, public's information, several member of the members of your board attended the Tennessee School Boards Association this last week, uh, held in Nashville, and we will be sharing some of that information at the December 5th work session. I think we came home with some, uh, some new and interesting ideas that we're, we're anxious to take a look at. Are there any uh, changes to the agenda that need to be recommended? All right. <coughs> Motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent, if we could have your report. Thank you, Madam Chair and, mem and members of the board. We have some, a few brief updates since we last met. Each year, Simon Youth Foundation recognizes its educators for the impact they have made on their students, academies, and greater communities through its national administrator and Teacher of the Year Awards. This year they presented that award to Mrs. Janice Cook, Executive Principal at our Dr. Paul Kelly Volunteer Academy. We will be honoring and congratulating her at our December meeting. Tomorrow we will celebrate the end of the 2018 Knox County Schools Coupon Book Campaign. This celebration will include our school campaign coordinators and our top selling teachers and students who sold more than 100 books Lunch will be served by Salsaritas at the Sarah Simpson Professional Development Center in the Great Room. On November 15, as part of American Education Week, Knox County Schools will host principal for a day across the district. I believe this year we have maybe 122 principals for, for a day, I think. A luncheon will take place at Sarah Simpson Professional Development Center after attendees spend the morning in our schools. As a reminder, Knox County Schools will be closed Wednesday, November 21st through Friday, no November 23rd for Thanksgiving break. Madam Chair, members of the board, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. And board members, if any of you have not had the opportunity to at attend the um, uh, Partners in Education luncheon where they recognize our coupon book winners, really you need to come. It is, it's fun and those kids are so excited. Um, when they're spinning the wheel for some of their prizes, you would have you, you'd think we're sending them to their moon. I mean, that's just what a, a, a fun event it is. So please consider coming in for even a short period of time. Uh, our next item is going to be a presentation on active transportation, street connectivity, and school busing costs. This is at the invitation of Ms. Bounds. So if you'd like to make introductions. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, um, well, as the school board representative for the coordinated school health committee, um, I often had the privilege of attending the Safe Routes to School meetings. Ellen, Ellen Zavesca 
is the principal transportation planner for Knoxville, Knox County MPC, and the Knoxville Regional TPO. So I'm going to let her introduce our presenter. Thank you, Ms. Zabiska. Thank you so much, Ms. Bounds, all the school board members and staff who are present. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of background on, uh, on the research you'll be hearing about. So uh, Ms. Bounds mentioned our Safe Routes to School Partnership. This is a group um, uh, that I serve on. We coordinate with the health department and the engineering staffs for the city and county and various other folks, including Bike Walk Knoxville, to just talk about how do we make it safer and easier for more, uh, more children to walk and bike to school. Um, and we uh, had an interest in discussing how uh, development patterns around our schools can affect, uh, can, can improve or detract from walkability to schools. And so this is an area where, like a lot of things in government, you've kind of got different entities making decisions that affect each other, and maybe they're not 100% aware of, um, of how, that, how those effects play out. And so in front of you, um, you've got some examples of two of the parental responsibility zones for the schools here in Knox County, uh, just to kind of illustrate that. So the one on top is a more is, is um, the uh, the more, a more urban, a more interconnected street network around a school, and you'll see that the orange line, which is the PRZ, where the students aren't um, aren't bused to school, um, is much larger. Um, is almost the same size as that purple circle, which is the, um, the, the crow's flight distance from the school of one mile. And so there's a lot more students who are able to walk to school um, and, uh, and less, less pressure on the school system for busing. And so the example behind that is a less connected uh, school zone. Um, and you'll see that the parental responsibility zone is much smaller. There's a lot of students who are close to the school, they're within a mile from the school as the crow flies, um, but they're still eligible for busing. They, they don't have a, a good route to walk to school because the streets don't connect between the school and the neighborhood. And those are decisions that are being made, that street connectivity is being made by the, the planning commission or county commission or city council. So we wanted to better understand what, what impact that has on the school system, on students' health, things like that. Um, and so Jeremy's research looked into that, and he'll tell you more about what he learned. Uh, Jeremy Auerbach is a postdoctoral research fellow who's working on understanding the relationships between childhood exposure to environmental pollutants and socio-behavioral outcomes in the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University. He received his PhD in geography at the University of Tennessee. Uh, and one of his projects was this one, and that's where he developed data, data science methods for transportation planning issues. And I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for uh, allowing us to show this presentation, and hopefully this will be uh, interesting. Yeah, so like Ellen said, uh, I've been working on this project with Eugene, who's over in kinesiology at UT, and this was part of my dissertation. Um, we're going to talk about how small changes in street connectivity can ultimately have big gains for, for student walking in Knox County. All right, so the, the intent and the outline of the study is as follows. So we were looking at how the impact on um, student accessibility and walking to schools um, if the residential developers built more connected um, uh, communities. So we're talking about like less cul-de-sacs, less dead-end streets that developers primarily are interested in building because they're attractive to, to, uh, to buyers in those areas. Uh, but there's a trade-off. And one of the trade-offs is there's going to be less uh, ability for students to walk to nearby schools. So what we did was we tried to evaluate uh, how student walking would be impacted if we added more connectivity or more streets to the developments that already exist uh, around schools in Knox County. And what we found was that even adding little short 
streets, we could have a huge impact, a uh, huge potential for, for student walking to nearby schools. So what are the benefits of student walking? Well, there's the obvious health benefit. Um, students walking are going to have um, uh, lower body mass index. They're going to get more physical activity. They have also been shown that students who walk to school are also active outside of this walking, so they're more likely to be physically active in sports and, and uh, other physical activities. And student walking is also correlated with academic achievement, so less delinquency, uh, higher performance in school, fewer disciplinary actions. Uh, but there's been an issue, so decline, there's been a, a major decline in student walking and active commuting to schools within the last <clears throat> 50 years in the United States especially. So 35% decrease has been shown across the U.S. For, for student walking. And some of that could be because of residential street connectivity around the schools. Like I said, the cul-de-sacs, dead-end streets. Um, there's also perceived safety barriers by parents. Uh, there's been surveys done by the CDC, for example, and they find that uh, student walking um, it, it hasn't been perceived as well by parents because of uh, crime, um, safety issues with transportation, traffic on the streets, uh, poor uh, climate, weather, things like that. There's also uh, school system uh, barriers too, such as liability issues, uh, the access to paved streets or sidewalks for the students to walk. And school setting has, uh, current trends in, in school setting has been placing schools further and further away from residential areas, cheaper land, uh, larger uh, uh, lots of land, and this reduces uh, the potential for, for student walking. Uh, there's uh, financial costs for this reduced student walking also. You know, we've got um, increased traffic from private transportation, increased air pollution, uh, more accidents. We have get um, uh, increased expenditures for busing, right, hiring drivers. There's increased fuel costs uh, within recent decades <clears throat> um, and maintenance of, of buses. So Knox, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but Knox County policy on student walking is we've got this, this, these PRZs, so it's a one mile for elementary schools and one and a half miles for, for middle school. And like Ellen said, this is a, as, as the crow fly distance. But when you actually look at the street connectivity and the street networks around schools, students that, that live within the one mile or one and a half mile actually have to walk much further than that. And so they end up getting bussed because of the, the reduced connectivity around these schools with the residential developments. So what we did was we tried to do a case study in Knox County. Uh, we didn't want to look at all the schools. It's a pr pretty big project if we did that. So we tried to narrow it down to uh, what we think are the, the, the schools that would have the highest uh, potential for student walking. So these are schools that are generally cited in suburban or rural areas that have a lot of residential homes in the area within the crow fly distance. But because of the street connectivity, uh, most of the students living in, in the, those residences can't walk, can't actually walk. So. Here's a couple examples up here. So we've got a suburban school and we've got a rural school. Uh, the red dots are homes within the PRZ distance for that school. The school is the black square in the center uh, of that circle. And the green dots are residences with, where the students could actually walk. So that's the actual, so a green dot is within the, the mile or the mile and a half for that school um, by the street connectivity. But as you see in a rural area, you've got much more green dots and, or much more red dots than green dots. So there's a lot of homes within that PRZ as the crow flies, but again, because of the street connectivity, they can't, these students can't actually walk. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, what we did was we tried to add new street connections uh, and just try to see what, what kind of impact that would be cost benefit analysis done for adding each of these streets. Um, so this is an example here of a suburban elementary school uh, in the center, and what we did was we added a, uh, added a street, and the street, 600 foot long street, um, to the southeast of that school. And those dark green dots in the south area, those are all additional residences that students could walk. Um, previously, they wouldn't be able to walk. They would be red dots on, on this, uh, this plot. So what we did with 600 square feet, we can capture 700 additional residents. So 700 houses where if a student was living, they could walk. Uh, and using the percentage of students living per house in this uh, school, di school zone, uh, we found that be about 100, extra, 100, about 120 extra students would now be able to walk because of a 600 foot long street. And that would save the county about four bus trips daily. Um, and according to uh, the bus costs for the county, it would be about almost $90,000 annually in savings. Um, and those 120 students would get about 40, 
on average about 40 more minutes of physical activity, and that's about two thirds of the daily activity for, for kids of those age. <clears throat> so we did, we got results for, for the 10 schools that we looked at. I'm not gonna go over this stuff here, but they're available, and if you're interested, you can contact us. Um, and I think some of the major takeaways from this are that if we can have more connected communities around schools, we're gonna have more opportunities for, for student walking. Uh, we should even short distances can provide uh, huge benefits for, for student uh, active commuting potential. Uh, that means fewer students to bus, the, the fewer traffic, fewer accidents, less air pollution, um, possibly increased academic achievement for those students walking, less delinquency, um, and ultimately healthier students. Thank you. Thank you. Board, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I've got one. Norman? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, how would you go about, like in our situation, finding these key locations for a short, you know, for a short street or an additional street? And then if you found that, how do you make that happen if it's on private property? Yeah, so our analysis is, um, well, the methods for our analysis are, uh, are available and anybody can use them. Um, uh, Ellen has access to, to what I did to try to identify these, these short connections. So I just developed a computer algorithm. I'm not gonna get into specifics, but the algorithm, what it did was it created uh, street connections between all the residences and other residences or existing streets or the school itself. Now there are limitations to, to this, this study right now, uh, and part of that touches on, on your second question. Um, some of these additional connections can go through private land or they can go through parks. Um, that's the next step to, to what we need to do. But this is our preliminary work shows our, or highlights that it's possible that even with short connections, you can capture a lot more students. So, so you perform the algorithm on certain school zones for us? Yes. So KCS. Yeah. Oh, so okay. I ran it on the, on the 10 schools, uh, but we can continue doing it on all the schools and we can add on to it where we can include uh, private property. Um, we could show that, yeah, it's gonna be costlier to go, you know, to build a bridge across a stream, for example, or ditch, or um, we'd have to go around parks or some commercial parcels. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're just, yeah, we're just putting streets wherever and trying to evaluate, hey, what's, what, what's gonna provide the most bang for the buck? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ms. Owen. Um, did you also consider terrain around the areas in looking at the potential for walking? No, no, again, that piggybacks on, 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 on his question. We, yeah, we haven't gone that far yet, okay. but that'll be the next stage, uh, next stage in the, in the analysis. So yeah. the, potential, the potential for the street, but not whether it's gonna be actually walkable. Sure, yeah, so there could be like, yeah, a gradient, right? Um, like, like I said, or train tracks or a ditch or something like that. that so we need, we need people on the ground to evaluate and say, okay, yeah, this could be feasible or not. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Babb? Yeah, I'm just curious, are y'all also talking to like MPC who, to me, you're looking at a lot of um, already existing developments, but as obviously our community grows, this seems like a great thought that would be for our MPC as we look at growth for our community, how it could save our, our entire community money through busing and everything else, if developments make sense absolutely. towards schools. Yeah, absolutely. That, so we had a meeting uh, uh, Monday morning with MPC and we presented a similar thing. Um, yeah, so the, the intent is really uh, for future development, not, not to retrofit existing developments, but for, you know, to try to get into developers' minds, hey, include student walking, right? If you're building around a school system or you know, um, there could be a potential school in this area. Think about the kids and, and their access to, you know, to the school. Ms. Baum? Yes, thank you both for coming. And I think I would just sum it up by saying, if, and Ellen, if you want to add anything else, that um, with our new two new schools that came online, there was a great push to try to develop some of this connectivity and to think in terms of sidewalks. So just to make the board aware as we go forward, if the new school should be built in the future, that we work with the developments around there that come in, that everybody can work together, MPC and, and um, county commission and school board so that we 
like you said, get the most for our money. So anyway, anything else you want to add, Ms. Ellen? No? Okay, thank you both for coming. Turn it back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you very much, it's much appreciated. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is uh, looking at renaming the Career Magnet Academy. And Ms. Hickman, if you come forward, speak with us about that. Uh, good evening, uh, board. Uh, as you noticed tonight, we talked about, uh, or we have on our agenda, the discussion of renaming the Career Magnet Academy. You know that as one of the 16 high schools in Knox County, the Career Magnet Academy is a very different kind of high school. And last year was our first year where we had a graduating class, so we're currently in our fifth year. And we thought it was an incumbent upon us to take a look at the programming, at how the school was going, and see if there were things we needed to do to make adjustments or to make the program more successful. So we uh, had a group, including representatives from Mississippi State, of course representatives from Career Magnet, and then others. Uh, including some of us from central office who came together to look at different kinds of data to see what direction we needed to go in, if any direction different than where we are now. So Leanne Hahn, the principal of CMA, is going to come up and present some information to you uh, in light of that information. So Ms. Hahn. Welcome, my, my FBI fellow. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you all for having me here tonight. It is always a pleasure to get to talk about CMA and specifically talk about um, the work that's been done the last six months. Um, as Ms. Hickman said, we started out with a working group last spring and we came up with some priorities and some challenges and, and the way we're gonna rise to meet those challenges. So I'm excited to share all of that with you all tonight, um, eventually asking if we can change our name. So um, just a little bit of background and history. When CMA was first designed, it was designed so that a student in his or her sophomore year would pick one of our four career pathways um, either in Homeland Security, advanced manufacturing, teacher, teaching as a profession, or sustainable design. And so the, the goal was, the purpose of that was, is that students would make progress towards an associate's degree. Some confusion came about that um, as students were unsure about whether it was towards a general associate's degree or an associate's of applied science. And what we know is that an associate's of applied science is designed to be a terminal degree that will, um, is, is a great option for students, but it's designed for students to go to the workforce. General associate's is, is designed more for students to get those transferable credits as they pursue the four-year degree. So um, that was our initial design. Um, currently, we have 84 of our Career Magnet Academy students enrolled at Mississippi State. And you have um, in your packet a little sheet that just kind of tells you all of the different courses that they are in. They are enrolled in 196 class sections, um, earning, working towards earning 612 credit hours. There are 26 different courses. Some of those are the career and technical education courses that lead to that Associate of Applied Science. And then um, 15 of those are those general education courses that will transfer to that four-year degree. This next slide shows you our current enrollment data. Um, as you can see, our target enrollment is 125 students per class. We are not there. We are not close to there. So that is definitely a challenge that we um, are working to meet as our, as our working group continues to um, look at how we're doing and come up with new and inventive ways to get students in. But that is an issue for us. Um, so as we met, we said, okay, our enrollment isn't where we want to be. Why is that? Um, our freshman class last year was about half the size. Um, all of our students, all of our juniors and seniors are not enrolled in Mississippi classes. They don't meet those benchmark ACT scores. Um, all of them don't. We have about 70 to 80% that do. Um, and then we had so many students who chose the teaching as a profession pathway with no desire to be teachers, but they wanted those general education courses. So that pathway was top heavy um, and the others did not get as much attention from our students. So we really um, 
we, we started off our working group by listening to our current students and their, um, they, they explained to us in very clear terms about why they were choosing the teaching as a pathway, teaching as a profession pathway over the others and what benefits they saw from that. And it was overwhelming that they wanted the transferable credits and not sadly to my teacher heart wanting to be a teacher. So we, just, we came up with our priorities. Our first priority is access. Um, we wanted to open up the entire Pellissippi State course catalog to CMA students rather than place them into one of the four pathways and say this is your pathway that you chose as a sophomore, so this is, this is all you've got. So we also have opened up all Pellissippi campuses to CMA students, so if a student can provide his or her own transportation and their parent is okay with it, they are able to take a class at the Magnolia camp campus or the Hardin Valley campus. And our wonderful partners at Pellissippi State are adding courses at the Strawberry Plains campus just to meet our needs. So we can go to them and say we have a student, we have some students interested in um, psychology or sociology and they work to add those for us um, because they are committed to, to this part partnership as well. Our enrollment is definitely a priority and what we know is that Career Magnet is not a student, is not a school for every student and that's okay, um, but we want uh, more students to have the opportunity and the option to become students at Career Magnet if they're interested. So up until this year we have only taken ninth graders and so you see the attrition there, there's no opportunity to backfill that with students. We are now opening that up and and taking students at the 10th and 11th grade level. And those students are really referred to us by their school. And it's based on their interest in one of, one of Pellissippi's programs. So um, we're not going into high schools and saying, oh, we want to take all of your kids. We're an option for students um, who want to explore the dual enrollment a little bit earlier in their career. Our third priority that we identified was readiness. Um, we, as I mentioned before, not all of our students were taking, were able to take advantage of the dual enrollment courses. And so we said, what do we need to do internally to make sure that by that 11th grade year, our students are ready for the rigor of the college classroom? So we became an AVID school this year. Our ninth and 10th graders are enrolled in AVID classes and our, all of our teachers are using AVID strategies in their classroom. And AVID is really all about that college readiness. It's about note taking skills and organization and study skills and really teaching kids how to advocate for themselves, which is we all know that that's a really important part of the college experience. AVID also allows us to do a lot of career exploration into all of the pathways that Pellissippi offers and not just that general associate's degree. Um, and then a, a wonderful part of AVID is that there are actual tutors that come in and help students during the day. Um, and we, our goal is to utilize our Pellissippi partners upstairs to come down and work with our students in AVID. Um, and then of course we want to solidify that, that vision that all of our students need to complete some type of post-secondary opportunity. So we are taking them on college tours to two and four year universities and colleges and um, to the Tennessee College of Applied Technology. So AVID has been a huge part of us preparing our students for the rigor of the college level. And the last priority we identified was communication. What we know is that um, being a college student comes with a, a vocabulary that may be foreign to some students and families and so we've really tried to break down that barrier. We, repur we repurposed one of our positions into a Dean of Students. He meets each semester one-on-one -on -one with students and families and they talk about what classes they're going to take, about what that, what that class means, is it transferable, is it not transferable, what are you on a path towards, um, what the financial part of that looks like, and you have in your packet, you have um, sheets that we'll use for each 10th, 11th, and 12th grade that explains that in a very um, user-friendly manner. So he meets with, with the student and their parents each semester, and then each week he meets with each student, all 84 of them that are taking college classes. And they talk about grades, they talk about due dates coming up, they talk about any barriers they may be having to success, 
um, and how he can help and support them. And he is our direct line to our Pellissippi partner. So he is upstairs on the college campus. He meets with the campus dean regularly. Um, and even if it's just in passing and casually, there is a face up there where students know this is my CMA support person. Um, and then we've really tried to beef up and enhance our student life. Um, we've added athletics, we have a bowling team and a cross country team. Um, we have, we've added more family-based school events just to create more of that community and culture because we don't have a zone. And so it's, it's not, um, you know, that, that my brother went there, my uncle went there. We're really trying to create that family type atmosphere. So that's how we've tried to improve upon that. And then we all know that the more families are there, even in a casual manner, they can see me, they can talk to our assistant principal or our counselor, and those conversations just happen more naturally that way. And so all of this work um, has been phenomenal, but has led us to think about our name and what it says about who we are and then what we actually offer. So um, the term career um, says that maybe we offer more of or only career opportunities when really we offer it all. The beautiful thing about working with Pellissippi is they have so many options and opportunities for kids and we want them to be able to take advantage of all of them. Our students and our families also told us you know, when we were being recruited, we almost didn't come because the name turned us off. Um, and so we really want to, uh, we know our enrollment is an issue. We want people in the community to know that we are here and that we offer this really <coughs> comprehensive programming for their scholars. So our, our process, what we hope to do is to um, set up kind of some type of online submission system to take feedback from all stakeholders. And so we, we definitely want to target our current students and families, our staff, the Pellissippi staff. Um, obviously, we would love your input and, and everybody from central office. And then we've worked really hard to develop some community partnerships in the past five years. And we want their input as well because they see, they're in our building, they see what we do. So we want to really take a lot of um, community feedback and input. Um, so we'd like to do that, then we would like to put together a committee with um, stakeholders from Pellissippi, from CMA, from Central Office, from the school board, Mr. McMillan, we'd love for you to be part of that, um, to narrow that down to things that we feel like really send the message to who we are. We don't want to be back here. I don't want to stand here again in four years and say, oh, we didn't get it right. We want to make sure that we get it right. Take a final vote in February and then have a big name um, celebration and unveiling in February. So that is um, what we hope that the timeline will be. Um, we, we look forward to your feedback and your suggestions as we move forward. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. I, I certainly understand your uh, rationale behind this. Are there any questions? Ms. Owens? I have I have several things I'd like to say, if I may. Um, I think the board might want to consider putting this off a month until board members can get a little more information. And um, I, hopefully I can explain why. Um, through no fault of Principal Hahn at all, because she has worked very diligently to make the, the magnet program into what was promised to students when it was first created. Um, I, I don't think, while the name change is definitely something that will go a long way, I don't think that's going to solve some of the problems that we have. And um, I hope all the board members will have some time to possibly talk with um, students and parents as well as with Dr. Ryswick about um, issues with this program. Um, I think it's a little disingenuous for us to say that stakeholders were confused because we told stakeholders. Um, what we told them in a flyer that was given out to them at the time is that if students have followed their course of study, 
they will be approximately six to eight courses short of an Associate of Arts, Associate of Science degree, or Associate of Applied Science degree, which can be attained at the conclusion of grade 13. So what we really need to look at is all of the resources that were put into this building that is far from most of our other schools um, and all of the promises that were made at the time because those promises were definitely not followed up on. Um, and that's just one example. We promised courses of study that we could not maintain. We promised that that they could finish high school with 33 college credits. Think about that. I don't understand how anyone in Knox County Schools thought that was possible. Um, I think we would be much better served to have the programs closer to students base schools and have them travel to Pilisippi instead of bringing all the students that are in the programs to Pilisippi and then having them travel to other Pilisippi campuses. Um, I, I'm not sure how that is really the most sensible way to cover the programs. We have several of these programs in our other high schools already. So we're asking students to travel to a very far off campus and then potentially travel to another campus instead of having their core program, their core classes at their base school and then have a partnership with Pilisippi. So I think that's something that would would definitely behoove us to look at. And if we have any information that the Department of Research could show us, I'd like to see a difference in the cost of busing all of our students currently that we send to Career Magnet Academy and the difference in the cost that could be if they were bused just to their courses at Pellissippi. So if they were in their home school and just left to take those Pilisippi courses instead of being bused from their home schools there even in their ninth grade year when they're not even involved in those courses. Um, they were promised internships and they, those were called 13th year internships. I'd be interested in whether any of those have happened. Does anyone know that? We've had some students complete work-based learning We've had a handful. Most students choose to continue in their Pellissippi courses and, and get that um, to, to get more college credit rather than the internship. But as far as a 13th year, I don't, internship, I don't, I, that's the first I've heard of that. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really not even sure where to start because there are just so many things. Um, The projected numbers when it was first opened, we were projecting 500 students and we put about 4 million into retrofitting the building. And I'd like to see some information on the total cost over time if we could get that for next time because I'm, it's my understanding that more later went into that. So if we could get the total cost of our programs at the Magnet Academy, I'd like to see those. Um, at the time that, that the building was being opened and also a time when Principal Hahn was not there, so my apologies that you're on the spot, um, visits were made to all of our middle schools to recruit students to these promised programs. So all of our middle schoolers heard basically a pitch on how they could get all of this coursework done and these amazingly cool programs that they were gonna be able to be a part of. And a lot of those programs never happened. An example would be um, a wildlife program 
on a campus where they were not allowed to plant trees. They were promised a fish hatchery. It's not there. They were promised um, all kinds of sustainable living courses that were also not there. Lots of, lots of pieces that never took place. So I would just very strongly encourage the board to go back, Google, Google's our friend, go to Google and look back at all of the things that were promised at the time and the things that we told parents they would have before we look at, at making other promises that we may not be able to keep and see if this is really our best option. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bounds? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, having followed this for quite some time since coming on the board four years ago and um, taking many tours of that campus, um, I would concur and kind of validate some of the things that uh, Ms. Owen shared. And again, Ms. Hall, this isn't directed at you or any um, other person at um, the campus. It does concern me. I looked through the slides and I saw the decrease in enrollment. And while I think the name change is a good idea, I think your initiatives have been well thought out, the committee, whoever worked on those. Um, the decrease in enrollment concerns me and the cost per student. And also um, the fact that I'm not sure that these initiatives alone will ever build that back up to where it would be sustainable. And I think it impacted uh, my district because um, some things were changed at Halls and their program and moved to Pellissippi that never developed, such as the hatchery, the wildlife, the, um, the farm and farm initiative and things like that. So. Um, I do have some concerns about just voting on this as a name change and new initiatives that this in and of itself will correct the problem that we have at that campus. So anyway. This, um, uh, this is not an item uh, that is even on our agenda. So, um, Mr. Law Director, uh, I've heard one of our board members make a request um, that that they delay this process. Is is there, is there anything beyond that that needs to happen or not happen for them to move forward or not move forward? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, at this point, it's not on the voting agenda for next week, so it's not on November's agenda. So the earliest that this item could come up for a vote before this board is going to be December. So, but if somebody doesn't want it on December, then, you know, some action would have to be taken at that point. I, I'm not asking for personal privilege. No, no, I, I understand. I totally, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, the, uh, this, all right, this is, not on the agenda. I hear them coming to us and just saying, this is what we're planning to do, and then we will bring it to you for approval. Is that correct, Mr. Dupler? All right. Um, I'm also hearing a board member, more than one board member stating, this might be a process that is not necessary because we may be doing something totally different anyway. So. My question to you, Mr. Dupler, is, is there, any, is there anything to stop them from going ahead with their process regardless of what we do as a board? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what, the, what the Law Director's Office would recommend is that uh, board members can, can reach out to the superintendent and then, and then the superintendent can, can make a decision as to uh, how, to, how to best proceed and then uh, bring forth a plan to the board or perhaps some different options to the board, not just one plan, but, but you know, two or more.
Mr. Thomas, do you have any comments? Well, uh, I, basically what we were asking to do, of course, is uh, understand the questions and we'll respond to those and get the information. Um, basically what we're asking is permission to start the process for a name change. It's not on the board for a vote uh, for next week. Uh, as I understand the timeline, it would be January. Um, so I think it provides us with adequate time to respond to the board members' concerns and questions and, and uh, possibly come back uh, and answer or provide you with, with uh, responses to those questions over the next few weeks. And um, so I don't see, see an issue with that. We just wanted to get it in front of you as early as we possibly could so that you you know, you would have that awareness. But we'll res we'll we'll get uh, respond to the questions that have been asked and and get that information for you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let, let Madam Chair, let me just say one other thing too. I know Dr. Rice and his staff have been heavily involved in 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 this every step of the way too. So uh, no, we don't have anyone from Pellissippi here. Oh, do we? Oh, okay. Uh, didn't know if there's any anybody that wanted to respond. Um, Would you care to uh, to speak? Good evening, and thank you for providing me with the opportunity to spend a moment speaking with you. Um, I have been uh, a uh, administrator with Pellissippi State for 25 years. Uh, and by the way, my name is Mike North. I'm the Thank campus you. dean at the Strawberry Plains campus. Um, I've served there since 2012 when we began. I was involved in many of the initial meetings and formation of this school and this program. So um, I have seen in a nutshell a number of the issues and problems that uh, were brought up this evening and have been very involved in the last uh, four to six months in terms of discussion of where we have been over the last four years uh, with seeing graduates walk across the stage last uh, May and seeing where do we want to go and where are some of the future directions. Um, very aware that there are some programs that did not come to fruition uh, for a number of reasons that uh, I don't necessarily need to sit here and explain for the next hour what they were. Uh, but there are some, um, but I do feel that uh, in general we're going in some good directions with what programs we have there and what we're doing at the campus. Um, uh, with regard to a uh, examination of what programs are there, uh, I believe that students have every opportunity to take advantage of the coursework. Um, I, I would like to point out that uh, while students get good exposure to Pellissippi State and college coursework at their own school, um, in general, and this might be a bit anecdotal, the experience that students have at a college campus is immeasurable. And uh, to them, uh, students that I've come to know personally, the experience that they've got at a college campus, being able to be on a college campus, interacting with college students and faculty is, uh, is wonderful. Uh, it enhances their growth, it enhances their ability to perform. Uh, it makes the transition seamless, and uh, that's the direction, one of them, that we want to go in now. Um, if this name change goes through, if we examine what courses and programs that we offer at the institution, at the Strawberry Plains campus, uh, the experience for the student will be more like simply being at uh, Pellissippi State, Strawberry Plains campus. If you're a student at the Career Magnet Academy or whatever the name may be, you're also a student at the Pellissippi State campus. One of the things that I think we need to go back and look at is uh, we, we looked at programs around the country. We looked at a program in Texas. Uh, we looked at what they did, and we made decisions about what we needed to do when we started this, this school and this program. Uh, and those are some things there now that we would see uh, some value in changing, uh, making it more of a seamless transition, making it more like if you're a student at the high school, you're a student at the college, and here are the expectations and here's all the support that we can provide uh, you to perform. But uh, again, more like if you're a student at the high school, you are a college student, and we want to put programs there that, that would uh, acknowledge that and make it uh, understandable to parents, understandable to students, that if you have the opportunity to be there at the school, you have the opportunity to get a degree or to get very close to getting one. Uh, 
I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know some of this conversation was uh, you know, a little general on my part, but if there's anything in particular that you'd like me to answer, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. And we, we, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Satterfield. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, your first graduating class was last year or two years ago? Last year? Last year. Do you have the, and this could be for the principal as well, do you have the trajectory of where they're at now or the information? Could you get us that information? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for stepping up, and it sounds like we'll be having a lot of further discussions on this. Uh, for the record, I would like to say on behalf of the board that we are very appreciative to everything that uh, Palisippi State Community College has done in their partnership with Knox County Schools. Dr. Wise has been an uh, outstanding partner in, in helping us integrate services. So that's much to be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Owens? I, I may need to make clear that I also don't put any blame on Pellissippi at all. Oh, yes. That was absolutely no fault. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we all are in agreement with that. All right. And moving along um, to the general session agenda, there are a few things that I need to read for you just to have them on the record. Terry did send you some changes to the agenda that that will be on the, um, the uh, November 14th. Um, well, in fact, I think they've already been entered into the copies that are on the computer right now. If you look at item 9C10, the utility easement documentation needed a correction due to the way the property is deeded. So what is attached to your agenda is the corrected version on parcel 77, if you'll make note of that. For item 9C22, Rocky Hill Elementary School is requesting to purchase Chromebooks with their coupon book proceeds and the communication to the families is now attached. For item 12C, regarding the renewal of a contract with UT for cultural competency training, the survey that was given to participants along with a sampling of their responses is also attached for your review. And item 13A, the methodology used for the cultural sections of the charter school monitoring report are also attached for clarification. In addition to these four items, the wording on item 9C5 has been updated to reflect the terms of the agreement and the option to renew for up to five years. So any of you out there that are following the agenda, please be sure and check again for these changes that have been made. All right, we'll go forward with the agenda items at this time. I'll direct your attention to uh, number nine, C, items and contracts, questions, item one, item two, Item three, four, questions item five, six, seven, questions item eight, nine, 10, questions for 11, Ms. Satterfield. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, what's the lifespan of a, um, utility, um, a car purchase? I'm sorry, the lifespan? Of the lifespan of when we purchase these, if we approve this item of this vehicle. We will normally get about 20 years uh, out of a vehicle, 15 to 20 years. It, it depends on the mileage and how heavily uh, it's used, but uh, we get we get our money's worth out of them. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for item 12, 13, 14? 15, 16, 
questions for 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, or 26. Moving on to board policies, 10A, questions? 10B, 10C. Mr. Norman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we all received a, an email from um, one of our teachers about, about the revision of this policy. And um, I think the only revision is that the, it's just the removal of the uh, notation about the length of the day for the principal, right? That's the only thing that's new. I was not present when the, this discussion took place, I guess, at, at the policy, the last policy meeting. I came in late to that meeting, so maybe it took place then. So anyway, I just wanted to throw out, uh, uh, remind the board of this lady's email and her concern about, especially about planning time, and then simultaneously just ask about why, why we're changing, removing that notation about principles. All right. Um, before I go on to the other uh, lights, Mr. Dupler, uh, I know that you addressed that in our policy review meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think, I think Dr. Reiswick can help on this as well. But, uh, you know, my guidance was from uh, the State Board of Education uh, rules and regulations. Um, it's one that, one that you all are I'm sure familiar with the 0520-1-3.03. I mean, you know, it's long citation, but it talks about administration of schools. It talks about teacher assignment. Teachers shall be on duty at least seven hours per day. It then also goes into some detail about duty-free lunch and planning time. Uh, but, uh, but like I said, I think I think Dr. Reiswick can address maybe the uh, the more the more specific. Uh, uh, application to the different schools in KCS. Dr. Roswick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I think Mr. Dupler has said that well. Um, as far as uh, to answer the question, maybe to get to Mr. Norman's question too, uh, we do uh, have seven hours I mean, in our school day with um, typically there's it says seven hours and 45 minutes. Typically we kind of have a minimum of 15 minutes before students and 15 minutes after. Uh, and then also uh, referencing the agreement with KCA, the MOU that we have with their same language used in that um, as far as that goes. Uh, with regard to planning time, it is, um, it is set aside for those two and a half hours for that planning time to take place. Uh, typically what we do if there's a concern that, that, that that's not happening um, is that we'll, we'll look into that internally or have those conversations. So uh, I haven't seen the email that you referenced, Mr. Norman, but if there are things that we need to look into or schools that we need to have those conversations. Sometimes there are cases where that could happen. There could be IEP meetings or ST meetings or those sorts of things that may, you know, are part of, of the job that could happen. Uh, you know, we could look into particulars if, if we have that. Um, and I think you ask as well, why do we remove the administrators portion of that? I think as the uh, committee discussed, um, administrators aren't necessarily bound to that time and, and most exceed that with extracurricular activities and in post uh, meeting so to put that at eight hours is is probably not sufficient and we didn't want to have confusion around uh, you know not covering those kinds of events because that's considered as part of the job okay and and that's fine I, I think that her her point probably was mostly around the inadequacy of a seven hour 45 minute day to do the things that, that they have to do especially as regards planning so you know a block schedule is for high schools and so on and so it kind of it, certainly they seem to have a better uh, a, a better ability to use planning and, and implement planning but 
the elementary teachers seem pressed, you know, and she talks about 60 hour weeks and so on, taking stuff home to plan and grade and all the things that they do, which is, is normal. You know, we expect that uh, pretty much everybody takes stuff home and, and works some, but um, anyway, I'll forward the email to you and to the superintendent and um, maybe we can discuss the planning aspect of it before also. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was, Tony, since you weren't at the meeting, I was just going to make the statement that I think the, um, the purpose of this change was not to really change any, anything that is expected of teachers or put any, any other demands on them because obviously they have more than enough demands on their time. It was simply just to align with the State Board of Education's rules and regulations. So I don't want teachers to think there was anything other than that in the, um, the reason for the change to the policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Owens? Several years ago in collaborative conferencing, I think this was discussed and my memory of it is very, very vague, so I can't really speak to what was discussed. But the concern at the time was the, the, the phrase, such additional time as the administrative organization requires. And I believe somewhere along the way it said um, additional time as the administrator requires. And so the concern was that some principals could be requiring their teachers to stay an exorbitant amount of time. Maybe they are requiring them to stay for ball games for five hours, two or three nights a week. Maybe they are requiring them to be there for um, an extremely long period of time every day. Maybe they are requiring one teacher to do um, extended duties at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. And so the concern was about, about the additional time because it is so vague as, as such additional time as the administrative organization requires. And I think that is what the discussion was at the time um, with the collaborative conferencing team. And I, I didn't really strike me when we were discussing this the other day, and it does match the language of both the law and the state board policy. Um, but I think it might be wise for us to, before voting on this, we might want to send it back to the collaborative conferencing team and have them take another look at it and see if they have concerns that could maybe be addressed with some additional language. If that makes sense. All right. Any other comments? Thank you. Moving on to board policies D. E. Questions for F. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, I punched my light. I was a little slow getting to right. No problem. I just want to make a comment on uh, uh, D on the agenda change, and I, and I I know we've discussed this. Uh, I guess it first came up when we had our retreat and talking about uh, personal privilege, and I'm very much in the minority. I, I realize. But uh, uh, I think it was mentioned that that, that one reason uh, we should look at abolishing it was because it allowed one person to control what was going on. And I think that's a little bit misleading in, in, in one respect. I think there, there are, and I don't have a real good example just off the top of my head, but I think there are times, occasionally, on rare occasions, that uh, it could be a benefit. And I don't know of anybody. I've been on the board for, I guess, eight years now. And I don't know of anybody that I would consider that has ever abused that. And. If it is something it points out still that there's a matter of, you know, 
if it was something that somebody was just trying to stop that was time sensitive, the chair and the uh, uh, superintendent could uh, overrule that matter. So uh, that's just my opinion on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Any other comments? My comment on this was that it um, it was it's uh, making more of an attempt to uh, align with Robert's rules. I think was was another one of the things that was discussed at the policy review meeting. All right, policies um, item. A oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I th uh, when we when we talked about this in the policy meeting. Uh, yeah, there was a, a lot of comment about possibly, like Mike says, a, a, a little bit too much weight given to the person that's, uh, or to an issue that is maybe in the minority. And so, um, and, and I was, uh, it, while I'm thinking of, the first time I looked at it, I was like, I think, I think this personal privilege thing gets in the way. If you get, if you've got an issue and you can, uh, you can make a substantial argu argument to get five votes, then you, you got it. You don't need it. You don't need personal privilege. But uh, in retrospect, you, you, if, if you're somebody that's in a severe minority in the, on the issue and you, um, th this would allow that person to have time uh, by using, the, using this device, so to speak, um, to, to delay and at least for one month and I, and I and I could see I could see how that might be beneficial so I think uh, I've, I've kind of reconsidered my position on it. Thank you Mr. Norman. Ms. Babb? I just want to make sure my understanding is is that you still have the ability to ask for it to be delayed it's just you don't have one person can't just stop it. It then has to be everybody in agreement to move it on. Is that correct? Uh, well, it would require a vote. Majority oh, right, vote. a vote. Oh, my, yes. a okay. Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Essentially, we would follow Robert's rules of order when you, when you make a motion to table a discussion until the following month, and we would then take a vote. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's correct. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dupler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I just wanted to clarify as well, uh, the way Robert's Rules of Order works on tabling, one could actually table an issue and then leave it on the table for several months until a vote was taken to bring it back off the table. Uh, also, a motion for deferment could be done, which would just defer it for, for one month. Uh, to Mr. McMillan's point, um, since since I've sat on this board, uh, sat, sat with this board, I'm sorry, and um, and and my predecessor, um, I don't know that it that it ever has been abused. I guess we could debate on on the on the term of abuse, uh, of abuse, but the way it's been interpreted in the past, and if this board so chose, we could we could make this. Um, uh, very, very clear as well, but the way it's been used in the past is that is that one board member would be able to take personal privilege for one month, then that board member would not be able to take personal privilege on that same issue the next month. That way, it could not be, you know, deferred over and over and over again. Um, however, another board member could possibly take it for that second month. So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's that that would be the potential for abuse. So, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your comments there, uh, Mr. Dupler. I think you're, you're correct. Uh, I just think that, that uh, in the past, for the most part, now this may not have been true in every situation, but for the most part, what it did is, in many instances, it gave the board additional time to look at a situation, gather a little bit more information, get some feedback 
it maybe it, it it hadn't been very well publicized with with the the public and get some feedback from from the, the people that were going to be impacted on whatever the situation was it uh, you know if you uh, you know, if you were on one side and eight people on the board were on the other side, it, it wasn't going to, unless the information or the argument uh, was was convincing, it wasn't going to change anything. It was just going to be a month later that the, that it became official. And I think in in some instances, I think that that has been beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. All right, moving along. Letter F, G, questions on H, I. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just had a question on I. When it says um, that students who complete advanced courses are eligible for the quality points and percentage points after a student sits for the Align culminating exam. For AP classes and IB classes in particular, does that mean that they have to sit for the AP exam held in May, or does that mean that they have to sit for a final exam held within their course? Mr. Ricework, Dr. Ricework, I believe you're the referring person on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it is for the uh, culminating exam, uh, the way the state board defines that, would be the AP test or the IB test in that situation. Um, a follow-up question on that. Does um, Knox County Schools and our um, participating high schools, do we offer financial compensation for those students who can't afford to take those AP exams? Great question. Uh, we currently do. Uh, we're able to do that through some different uh, funding sources. Uh, those, uh, there's some federal funds that we can use that way currently. Uh, there are also some reduced rates and some, some things that the state does for that. So currently we, we are able to do that to uh, help. Uh, and, and the way we do that is principal kind of has discretion based on the need for students um, and submits that. But you, it, you raise a good question because, you know, long term those, those aren't guaranteed every year. Uh, so far we haven't run into that issue. but. Uh, again, this wasn't necessarily our choice, but just us being in compliance with the state board. So this is something that's happening in like counties across Tennessee? Like yes, this policy? yes, the, the state board okay. passed this policy and then we had to be, uh, we, we had a lot of conversation with the state board in this process um, and with our principals as well as how to do this the most fair way to be in compliance with that. But uh, they did pass uh, the requirement for that. Okay, one last question. Um, so for seniors that are taking a, a AP class um, in their fall semester, but say are graduating early, um, they would have, would they have to wait till May and then come back and take that exam to receive credit for those? Correct, they, the, the college board only gives those exams nationwide in the, yeah, in the, in the so uh, in the spring. So they would have to come back to get that. And, uh, there's there are two incentives that go with uh, the advanced academics one being quality points which mm -hmm. gives you the five point skills you're familiar um, and the other is the percentage points previously all you had to do was take the course to, to receive both of those incentives yes. uh, and this is a change now to where the quality points we can still do uh, to, to change that grade scale but we can't give the percentage points until they have actually sat for the exam which would be in the spring in the case you just said okay thank you right. thank you miss south miss horn Ms. Babb? Um, I, I was, my question was pretty much like hers about the financial aid and I just would like us to be aware of that in the future because we want to encourage kids to take these classes but for kids economically disadvantaged, if you're taking a whole slew of AP and a whole slew of IB tests, um, you know, it's several hundred dollars and I know it could be cost prohibitive for people even thinking about choosing to take this and I would hate for kids to ever think that they could not take these classes because they could not afford to take the test at the end. Thank you, Ms. Babb. Any other comments? All right, moving on. Item J. I'm now in the grant section. 
letter A. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Can we get a little bit of background about what this program is? Uh, Dr. Reiswick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Satterfield. Uh, I'm and Ms. Uh, Andrea Berry, our science supervisor, is here uh, in, in, in the STEM program as part of, of uh, her department. So I'll let her come up and give us some more detail on that. But uh, basically, this is a, it, it's kind of an overview. It's a five-year uh, grant that allows us to offer STEM programming during the break times, um, spring break, fall break. Uh, there's potential for some winter break and then some summer ends of that for students to be able to, in, in uh, K-5 to participate. Uh, and some STEM activities, but I'll let her expand because she can answer more questions. Ms. Barry? Did you have, thank you, board, so much. Um, did you have a specific question in mind you wanted me to address? No, I just, um, and this could just be just my night being naive, I just didn't know what it was. So that was good, what he told me. Um, well, this is a very prestigious grant to be um, awarded and considered this grant. So we were eight, I think, um, one of 18 out of 284 applicants and um, the design of the grant is to kind of touch base with students year-round in increments with STEM and a STEM career focus lens. Um, we have a little bit of flexibility in our programming with the curriculum um, our, we'll have teachers that we hire as writers for that curriculum and facilitators um, but it's something that we can do that is for some of our schools when times of break, when our parents um, may not have a capability for programming, such as um, some of the great programs that you may pay for during breaks, this kind of gives them um, an engineering, a STEM focus, career focus programming for that third through fifth grade range. Year one is going to be about um, five schools and about 20 students per school. Um, and in the fifth grade, realm and then in year two we're looking at expanding into 10 schools and opening that up um, to more grade levels at that time um, that's that's about it is there anything? thank you miss Babb. miss Barry this is for you um, will the majority of the grant be used for staffing costs or where do you see the majority of it actually being used um, there is a significant amount that is uh, a little bit for staffing. However, um, there's, um, we have, like for curriculum developers and the institute leaders, um, staffing to run the whole program. Um, but we also have costs for, um, for programming itself. So the cost of the supplies for the programming. But yes, the, probably the majority of it is a little bit of staffing there. And curriculum development. Ms. Satterfield. Yeah, thank you. Um, have you selected the first, the five schools for the first year? They have been um, somewhat selected. We've, that is still open. We actually have a little bit of time to kind of um, get that firm. There are a few parameters around that we want um, some school populations with um, high need students um, and Right now, those schools um, that have been identified um, and we're still in discussions with some of the principals as we kind of roll out the nuts and bolts of all this, and um, that is Ball Camp, Val Morris, um, Cedar Bluff, Green Magnet, and then one more um, possibility. Right now, it's Sarah Moore Green is named, but they've got a lot of programs going on and in discussions. Um, with the principal and staff, you know, it may, we're gonna keep that open to a possible um, different school there. And then in year two, we'll open that up to five more schools. Thank you. And those have not been established at this point. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, moving on. Grants, letter B. C. Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if this grant is what it will be used for and if this binds us to any future obligations. Uh, I believe that would be Mr. Oaks. Yes, ma'am. This is a uh, state grant uh, for this year, 
and it is designed to allow for the offset of the cost of fitting new school buses uh, with seat belts. And the way we have structured it, we don't require seat belts to be on our buses except for our small buses. They all come uh, equipped with seat belts. And it is a grant, uh, or it's a reimbursement directly to the contractor from the state. We're, we act as the middleman. So there is, there is no ongoing commitment once that's in place. And we have one contractor that indicated he would be interested in participating in it. And if he buys two new buses uh, that meet the standards of, of the grant and he applies for reimbursement, he can get up to $20,000 uh, for total $10,000 for each bus, as I understand it. And there's, there's no ongoing commitment and it's, it's just a one-time offer. Thank you. Ms. Christie. Oh. oh, Mr. McMillan, I'm sorry. Sorry, I punched the wrong button. Uh, first, it, it, it only involves new buses. It doesn't involve, uh, in, it, if, if a contractor decided that they wanted to install uh, seat belts on, on a bus or, 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 or some, would, would that qualify or not? My understanding is this involves only new buses, and there's some challenge with retrofit of buses for seat belts because, and, and this, this gets into uh, a lot of detail that I don't have off the top of my head, but there's concerns with, with retrofitting buses for seat belts and whether it does anything to the structural integrity of the bus and whether the uh, manufacturer would continue to warrant uh, that piece of equipment or not. So retrofit is not something we're particularly interested in. It's it's buying buses that come equipped with. Okay, I think you've answered the question. There just wasn't any information with the with the attachment other than the dollar figure, and we just kind of wanted. I think uh, 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 we just wanted to have a, a good idea of where we were going, how it would be distributed, and you, you indicated only one contractor thus far that was even interested in it. So. it yeah, and, and, and we can't go backwards at this point. We've applied on behalf of that contractor, so he's the only one that can participate. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Moving on, item D. E, F, G, H, item I, J, K, L, M. Moving into contracts, item 12A, questions? 12B, 12C, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can we hear what this portion of the contract with UT would cover? Believe what the professional would development would or, include. I'm sorry, Dr. Reiswick, who's most appropriate here? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. You're correct. Ms. Massey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, when we brought the contract originally, it was for five years, um, but Mr. McMillan requested that we bring it back when it was due, and the, the, it renews in January, so I'm here early. Um, and I have several people here to, if you have questions, I thought rather than hear from me, um, Judd Lauder is here. He's one of the presenters and works real closely with us. And then I also have a couple of teachers and a couple of principals who've been through the training, so I thought that might be helpful information. I provided you a summary of the evaluations. You can see at the top the scores, the average score for the elementary, middle, and high. And then we provided you with just some feedback, and we divided that. Um, that represents up, up until this last training. We had a training on Tuesday, and obviously 
we do multiple schools at a time and we haven't had time to tabulate all of those scores. But we, you, this is a representative sample that is ratioed equal to the responses that we get. So we get far more positive, some neutral, and then we do get some negative responses. I do want to let you know that we meet after each session, um, myself and Dr. Odom and Tammy Campbell with the presenting team and talk about feedback that they've received, that we've received, and we've made, or they've made some changes and added some information that was requested by staff, et cetera, after each session. So I feel like we've just, you know, the sessions have, begot have gotten better and better. But with that, I'll stop talking and see if anybody has any questions or if you'd like to hear from our guest. So going forward into this contract, does it continue the same presentation? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer your question, did I? Had the thing that's that okay. in my mind. Um, it, we, the year one, we will finish with year one that's in the contract. At the end of this year, we will have all schools trained with tier one and then the description of tier two, which will become more individualized for schools, will become a part of that. This is the same, this isn't a new contract, it's the same contract you approved last year. And then year three, it becomes much more, we did a broad overview and then it becomes much more individualized and I'll defer to Judd if there's more details. Where are you? Yeah, that would be great if we could just hear what yeah. your, what that next phase would encompass, please. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the first year and a half, we'll finish that in April, um, is the broad overview training all of the faculty. We've, we've hit almost 5,000 of your faculty so far and we'll have finished all of them by April. The overview sessions they're doing right now is very much about, uh, it's very heavy vocabulary and very much about self-reflection. Um, several of the board members have come and, and uh, attended several of the sessions. Um, the goal of that is getting everyone speaking a similar language. And after that broad overview is finished, we move into working in individual schools with specific contexts and issues that they have in those schools. Okay, so how do you see that working in that would, if a school has a problem, are they calling you with, with what the issue is or what the con would? Well, the way the contract was written and approved last year is there would be uh, members, uh, faculty members from each school identified as point people and we would begin meeting with them and supporting them as they help to um, address issues that they have in their individual schools. The overview is very broad. Um, and the issues that you have at one school are not the same as you would have at another. So it, it's really getting on the ground with specific schools and helping them. And it's really just us providing support uh, to the faculty in those schools, not really doing the work for them, but just giving them um, information and support as they tackle the issues that they have. Okay, and this, this is probably from Ms. Massey. So the cost for that is the same as what, what the cost for year one was? Correct. Okay. But there will, be, there will be someone working with every one of our schools. They'll do trainings of those teams, they'll provide some support, and then they're, they're is, they're, they are hiring additional staff. It's listed out in the contract, and I don't know if you remember how many specifically, so that they can provide additional support to those school teams. No, it's a, the, uh, the original RFP set a cap of what the cost could be, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Anyone want to hear from anyone else in the room about the contract? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Uh, board, we're going to take a 10 minute break and come back to the regular agenda items. We could please uh, readjourn at uh, 640. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting back to order. It's uh, 6.42. Um, I've had a request uh, from Ms. Massey and also a couple of board members wanting to hear from some of our guests in the audience that uh, uh, had come for the cultural competencies. So, Ms. Massey, I'll turn this back over to you to proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm going to introduce Ms. Lutton, and then she's going to have a few comments, and then we'll let her introduce her teachers. Holston Middle School Principal Katie Lutton. Madam Chair, board members, superintendent, thank you for inviting us to speak um, on behalf of the program and the training um, for becoming more culturally relevant and promoting culturally relevant environments for <coughs> our students. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm the principal at Holston Middle School, and I want to introduce our two teachers here, and they, they're going to speak about their perspective of the training and where we want to move forward with that. So I, I'll introduce um, Christy Richards. She is an ELA teacher in the sixth grade, and then Alyssa Bryant is a related arts art teacher um, at the school. And, and as far as my perspective of the training, and then I'll give it over to our, our teachers, because they're on the ground and they're using these ideas with their students. I know um, by my perspective, I thought that the training, and I believe Ms. Satterfield, you came with us to the training, so it, it opened up a dialogue with uh, not only members of the board, but within our staff about uh, regarding, regarding differences. And it isn't just you know racial differences, differences regarding gender, um, differences regarding religion or re uh, religious uh, proclivities, all of that was explored with this training. So it's really, it's, it's about understanding, uh, you know, people and where they identify and their differences. Um, and then our own implicit biases and expectations of people. So, um, for example, we may expect that all students bring with them certain skills and social skills um, and expect that they just know them before they come to our door. However, that may be a little bit of a high, high expectation for some students who may not have had those skills modeled to them at home or may not um, come equipped with those skills. So it's incumbent upon us to help teach those social skills um, and help teach students about, you know, uh, opening themselves up to others' differences and becoming more um, empathetic and empathic li listeners and learners. Um, also, you know, it, it just became, you know, incumbent upon us um, to have more strategies um, after the training, and I'm, I was glad to hear from Dr. Lauder about what year two was going to hold and, and how that consultative piece is going to really you know, make everything relevant to our school and where our needs are. Because as, as all of you know, Holston Middle was um, heavily impacted last year uh, due to the rezoning of about 450 of our students to Gibbs Middle School. And we then received several new students uh, to our zone, about 100, 120 students to us. And so it shifted, uh, you know, our, our student demographic, it, it shifted socioeconomic status. And so it was, it, it, it really made it more relevant to us as far as having this training. We needed it. Our staff knew we needed this, this training because we had a different student population coming to us. And we were going to teach every student coming through, through that door. And we needed to understand where they were coming from, you know, opening ourselves up to differences that we hadn't seen before. And so I'm, I know moving forward, we do need those strategies. And I'm glad to hear that those are, are coming down the pike for us. Um, something that I know, I know Ms. Richards will talk about here in a second, but uh, over the weekend, uh, while the uh, TSBA conference is going on, the ASCD conference was also at the Gaylord Opryland Hotel. And um, we learned a lot about equity in, uh, in education, um, equity with promoting the, the trauma-sensitive uh, classrooms, equity with uh, positive behavior uh, initiatives and supports. Um, we learned a lot of that and how we can fuse that with the a culturally relevant environment. And I know for us how we're going to make that more actionable as next semester because we, we do see a need of, of 
giving teachers more tools. We're going to actually create a cluster cycle around giving them more tools um, to create that culturally relevant environment to promote the PBIS structures, trauma-sensitive classrooms. Um, a great model of this is uh, called a Expanded Success Initiative of New York City, headed by Paul Forbes, learned a lot from that session, and I hope to um, you know, draw a lot from, from their work there, because they did a lot of that um, in New York City already. Um, you know, lastly, this is generating excellent conversations and practices around equity, right? Not, not equality, um, equity, um, because what's, what's equitable isn't what's always equal. We need to make sure that we meet students where they are to, to help them excel. And um, we need to make sure that we're also um, opening the door to students who may not have had op opportunities in the past to more rigorous coursework, honors coursework, that, that we're helping to open that door for them. Um, so curriculum choices, celebrations, activities, um, academic honors levels for more of our students that may not have had that option in the past, we wanna make sure that we're opening that door to them. And so all of these conversations in the training have helped open our eyes. It's really been a perspective um, process. And so now next year, I'm glad to hear that it's going to be more actionable with more strategies, and it's more of a consultative approach from what I understand um, that it's gonna meet our needs at Holston Middle School. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Christy Richards and she'll come up and she'll give her perspective of, of the training and then uh, we'll move on to Alyssa Bryant. Thank you. Um, as Ms. Letton said, my name is Christy Richards. I teach sixth graders at Holston Middle School and I have and the joy of teaching them uh, reading and writing and all that goes along with that. This past year, when we were invited or asked to do the cultural competency training, there was a lot of misinformation given to us prior to the training. There was a lot of resistance from a lot of teachers about what this would expect and what is this saying about us as teachers and are we not professional? And what we learned through this training um, is that we, have a, there are times we have negative biases and we bring those in. There's times we have positive biases and we bring those with us as well. And that we have an influence on our students and we have to take in, um, into consideration what they bring with them. Prior to the cultural competency training, I often said that I was colorblind. I treated students of all races the same regardless of their color, their race, their religion, or their beliefs. And I thought that that was a good thing. After completing the training, I realized that I don't need to be colorblind, I need to be culture aware. My students bring their own special contributions to our classes because of their race, their religion, and their beliefs. And I need to be aware of how those differences need to impact my instruction and how they impact my students' learning. Cultural training and social emotional learning at the ASCD conference this weekend also impacted my thinking of how do I treat my students? Do I treat them with equality or do I treat them with equity? How do I make sure each student gets what he or she needs to be successful in light of their differences in culture, language, socioeconomic status, religion, or gender, not in spite of those differences? By that I mean in spite of their differences puts the burden on them. It puts it on their culture. If I teach in light of their differences, it puts the burden on me to make sure that they are getting what they need Equality says all students receive the same instruction and support. Equity says all students receive instruction and support that meets their needs to help them reach the same goals. Our goal as instructors needs to be equity for all students. There's been resistance among educators to changing those long-held beliefs, demonstrating both positive and negative biases. We've made progress in our schools and in our community, but there's still a long way to go. The training we've received to this point has been a beginning. It's opened up the conversations, but more is needed. We need <clears throat> practical solutions and resources that can be implemented in our classrooms that allow us to maintain discipline in instruction and growth while not disrespecting our students and their cultures. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Alyssa Bryan, as she uh, mentioned before, and I teach art at Holston Middle School. Um, the predominant moment that spoke to me during our, our training uh, was when we shared stories about ourselves and our diversities within our community at, at Holston. And it really kind of made me think, wow, we don't really know each other at all. Um, I've shared a lot of personal you know, things of my life and diversities and cultural background for me. And Mrs. Uh, Lutton has really started that idea of school community. And so we've been doing a lot of uh, activities and team building. And I think that as when we are getting to know each other, that's just going to further impact our students. So uh, during the training, we talked about our, ourselves, talked about our diversities. And so I think once our school is making that decision at Holston to get to know each other, that will just impact our students even greater. Um, and in our related arts department, we are also reading The Dream Keepers, which I encourage everyone to read uh, in our PLC group. It's fantastic. And it's really just, again, it started that conversation that we need to have. Um, as far as the format of the training, it wasn't a lecture setting, and I think, um, I know that since college, I can't be the best person to sit in a lecture for hours on end, so I think maybe uh, the goal of the training obviously was to incorporate cult cultural competency in our training and our teaching, um, but maybe smaller groups would be a little bit more engaging and really break down those barriers um, and start that conversation. Um, in future training, like they mentioned before, we really need those tools and those specific scenarios to be an effective educator. Uh, you know, it may make us really uncomfortable. It may make us feel vulnerable, but if that makes me a better educator and makes me a cultural relevant teacher and proficient, then let's have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Massey, were there others? Mr. Quorum, I tried to let you go home. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Superintendent Thomas and board members, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to speak very quickly because I, I've been under the weather and I do not want to start coughing. So um, pardon me if I speak quickly at times. Um, you know, the cultural competency training has allowed us to really kind of align our school goals with the uh, goals that were laid out by the superintendent in, in reducing disparities. And one of the ways that we've been able to use this training is um, through Ms. Massey's office, uh, Jeff Wright is one of the personnel that's, that's been provided to provide um, cultural sensitive training to our staff, uh, also classroom management techniques to our staff. Uh, and we were able to have a couple of meetings with our staff to generate really genuine conversation about how we approach kids, how we approach um, individual cultures, how we use that in classroom management. And we've really used it to uh, take a look at our disciplinary system. And to give you an example of that, uh, when I became the principal of Carnes High School in the 2016-17 school year, um, at the end of the school year, after piloting the <laughs> online disciplinary system that was provided to us by Ms. Massey, uh, we were able to share data with our teachers that in that school year we had written a little over 1,200 referrals, disciplinary referrals. And what I was able to do with our staff is to translate that to them in the sense of you as educators will understand this, that when a referral is issued and an administrator addresses that, uh, from the time you start that process, when you meet with a student, contact the parent, gather evidence, investigate the process, that's about a minimum of a 45-minute process. So when you translate that into that number of referrals, that was roughly about 54,000 minutes that was lost in instruction, uh, in, proce in processing discipline. And when you translate that back to teachers, um, it was really... Uh, crucial for them to be able to analyze, okay, what are we writing referrals for? What are, what are, what is really a necessity to come to the office to be addressed? And so this training really allowed us to, to better align our disciplinary process with making sure that we're addressing uh, what needs to be addressed from a disciplinary standpoint, but also equipping our teachers you know, to address issues that can be uh, addressed within their realm uh, of governance within the classroom. And 
with the training that we've been provided through this, the training that we've been provided through Ms. Massey's office, uh, I feel like that we've really been able to take some progressive steps to reducing our disparities and, and ensuring that we get our students the, the maximum amount of time that we can on task in class with a, with, a, with a great teacher because as you know as educators, nothing will ever replace time on task with a great teacher in the classroom. And so uh, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak this evening. I thank you for you know, providing us with the resources you know, to continue the, the work that we're doing in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Massey, was there uh, any, any, any other folks? All right, thank you. And I apologize, we certainly didn't mean to overlook anyone in this process. All right, with no further questions on that, we will move on to our regular agenda items. Uh, item A, accept charter monitoring report for Emerald Academy. This has been recommended by our superintendent. Uh, Dr. Ricewick, would you like to address this? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, actually, I'll have uh, Ms. Jackson uh, call her to speak, please. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, this is a, a charter monitoring performance that um, we have come to in a collaborative agreement um, looking for a, a process that will highlight the areas where schools are doing well in a given year and highlight the areas where schools need to work in a given year. And so. Um, this monitoring report looks at several different areas. Um, it looks at academics, it looks at school culture, it looks at student attrition, it looks at their finances, and it looks at the organization. Um, we have published the metrics and the methodology along with this so that this can be the ongoing form that we use year to year. We can plug in those numbers and have those good conversations. Um, we did ask and um, Emerald agreed to go ahead and write a response um, and include that in the initial monitoring report. So with your approval, this is what we would like to send to the state for our monitoring. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Moving on to item B, approving the renaming of the Lincoln Park Technology and Trade Center to Lincoln Park Center. Uh, Mr. Oaks, do you have any comments or qu to address the board with? Uh, the only thing I would say is, is what we included in our letter uh, that's attached. We've done a lot of uh, work over the summer and significantly changed the use of that facility uh, as we've moved in the Paul Kelly uh, Academy and uh, the Welcome Center. And uh, we don't feel that the name reflects uh, the predominant use of the facility anymore. We still have technology and trade over there, uh, but uh, we think a more generic title is, is more appropriate. All right. Questions, comments? Moving on to item C, approve resolution of the Knox County Board of Education to surplus parcel of property formerly known as Thor Thorn Grove Elementary School. Uh, Mr. Oaks, is there any comments or anything I, on this? Ma'am, I have to defer to the law director on this one. That came from their office. All right. Dupler. Uh, what I would, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I've, I've discussed this with, the, with Mr. McMillan as well and, and, and Mr. Oaks, but what happened was um, we researched this, this piece of property and found that the deed talks about um, it, it reverting back to the original owners if it ceases to be used as a school. Uh, you all can see by the, uh, by the documents attached that, that, that this area uh, stopped being used as, used as a school uh, in the early 50s. So, uh, but it, with that said, um, it's, it was used for a long time as a community center uh, with, with, with no objections. Uh, so, so it's, so it's not that anybody was taking advantage. Uh, and then, um, earlier in this decade, uh, unfortunately the structure burned, uh, uh total loss. So at this point, um, uh, through our research, we felt that it would be good to, uh, 
to surplus it. Uh, school administration agreed. Um, and again, we talked about it with Mr. McMillan since it's in his district. So. Thank you. It's all good with you, Mr. McMillan? <laughs> uh, the only comments that, that I've heard were positive comments from community members. I've heard of no one that, uh, or at least uh, I haven't haven't had any anybody contact me or I guess say uh, that they objected to it uh, just as long as the community understands what's going on I think the majority of, under the circumstances uh, support it it Mr. Dupler pointed out that it uh, did operate for a number of years as a community center and it didn't cost the uh, the county anything or the school system anything they they maintained the the building and the property during those years that they used it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item D, approve certified retirement incentive plan. We have had this presented to us and, and um, um, I've, I've had many, many questions addressed to me. I know that uh, Mr. Bolton is out there, at least I believe he is. <laughs> um, is there anything additional that you'd like to add to, uh, to what you've already told us about the, uh, before we vote on this plan? Absolutely, Madam Chair, the rest of the board, Superintendent, Mr. Thomas, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, one slight change that we, that we made uh, after, the, we, after we met was, we looked, there was about 12 folks that were above the age of 65 that essentially got no benefit from this uh, plan. So uh, we, um, in consultation with the law director and Mr. Mr. Dupler, we uh, um, we added a phrase in there to guarantee payment of the stipend for at least 12 months, even for those folks who were above the age of 65. So we made that change. I felt like it was a, a good change for those folks to appreciate their service, uh, and and also some of those folks that were on the cusp of 65 who would only get the benefit a few months months. This way they're guaranteed a, a year's worth of the stipend. Um, so that's, that's basically the only uh, additional information that I have regarding the, the presentation that I made last week other than uh, just want to kind of clear up a few things. Uh, uh, essentially when we, were, when we were looking at, you know, um, at, at trying to, I really want to spend time looking at how well we compensate our teachers and how we're able to to do that, and I think it fits in with the superintendent's uh, initiatives, particularly where we're creating a positive uh, culture and climate. And so as we look at where we can find money, this hopefully will be an opportunity where we could take some dollars and reinvest those uh, in salary and benefits. And I've heard uh, a lot of positive comments about it. I've heard a few people say uh, some things like, well, they just want rid of our most senior teachers, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, we would like to, uh, as a matter of fact, this is an optional thing, so it's, there's not anything mandatory about it. Uh, for those who elect not to take it, we're hoping that we could improve. We have a directive from the board to add, or at least look at opportunities to add steps to our, our salary schedule and, we'll, and reinvest those dollars back into salary. So if a person hypothetically does not take this, then Hopefully, they'll be benefited by this uh, with improved salary. So um, that was one thing. The other thing I kind of wanted to uh, point out was that this plan in no way guarantees any part-time employment. There will be opportunities for part-time employment, uh, and, and I think there will be a lot of opportunities for part-time employment, but it in no way guarantees part-time employment. Just to reiterate, the... Uh, um, the IRS requires a bona fide retirement, which means there can't be any, any arrangements made for employment uh, prior to retirement. And there's a 60-day 60, 60 window that has to, to, to go through before we can enter into those conversations about bringing people back in a part-time basis. So with this plan, uh, that's, that's why the, the date of July 27th is the date that we marked for the retired teacher fair uh, to, to look at those positions where we can bring back. But I want to answer any questions that y'all may have, though. Thank you. Mr. Norman? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thanks, Scott, so much for being a math geek and coming up with all the permutations of this thing um, that looks very, you know, very, um, uh, looks like it could be of great benefit to us long term. Uh, what, what, what could go wrong? You've got options. So you, you're, you've got this, this uh, view of what could happen, what might happen. So just talk a little bit about what, if, if there's some you know, unexpected things or different ratios of people that might participate. Just, just talk just generally about that. Uh, well, when we looked at the numbers, we looked at around 700 people who were identified for this plan. Um, and recognizing uh, that if we had seven people walk out the door tomorrow, that would be catastrophic for us. I mean, you can only imagine. Uh, when we look at different subgroups of teachers and different types of teachers, different subgroups of positions, we kind of took that into consideration. Uh, so when this plan, as this plan rolls out, let's say we have a lot of people that, that take us up on this offer and, and retire. Now, I think when we're looking at that 25-year retirement, there's probably around 115, 120 people that we've identified. I don't think very many, if any, of those folks will, will, will take this offer. Uh, there's too much of a reduction in their TCRS benefit to do that. But let's just say uh, that we have a, a mass exodus, so to speak, where we have a lot of teachers in, in hard-to-fill positions that leave. Um, well, the way that it, I see it rolling out is as those positions have been identified to be positions that we replace, then we go through the normal process of seeing where we can fill you know, those with, with candidates. Um, if we're unable to fill those positions, that's where the retired teacher fair comes in. So if we're unable in the first iteration to fill that position with a teacher, a certified teacher, we've got the second iteration, a fail safe for the retired teacher fair uh, to split that position into two part-time positions and then fill it, fill it that way so that we have a safety net if that were to be the case. Any other questions? I, I want to uh, speak personally that any comments uh, addressed at, at uh, uh, active effort to get rid of our older and more experienced teachers um, is certainly not the case or the intention at all. I have had several teachers contact me that I think are going to take advantage of this opportunity and um, and this school system is going to be sick to lose them because they are so good. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that things will work out for them to come back and, and still be able to uh, help us out part time. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, item is public forum, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have one speaker for public forum, Mr. Bobby Wells. Please state your name and county of residence. I'm Bobby Wells. I actually live in Loudoun County, so don't hold that against me. Okay. As, as I explained to Mr. Wells ahead of time, um, this public forum is for Knox County, and we have to vote if uh, you're out of residence, so I make a motion that we allow Mr. Wells to speak. He's one of our seventh grade teachers at West Valley. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Go right you. ahead. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity and you guys hearing me out. Uh, Bobby Wells, I've taught at West Valley actually sixth grade uh, for 15 years now uh, under Miss Kelly for a little bit of that time. So. I did uh, reading for a few years, I've done history for a few years, and now I'm doing math, so I'm kind of all over the place. But mainly I wanted to kind of come up here and be the minority, I guess, and a little bit of the bad guy, uh, and share my personal experience with the cultural competency training that happened at my school in early August. And uh, I say bad guy because it's kind of hard to say that you don't want to be culturally competent or culturally sensitive, right? But I think that the training um, from my experience so far, which I know is brief, um, tends to have more of a negative impact than a positive. So I'd like to share that. Uh, I had three presenters that day, and I just want to give a brief synopsis of what happened. So the first presenter uh, 
wanted to discuss how we should be inclusive and diverse and accept all cultures. And I agree to a point is what I explained to her and I, I challenged her and said that um, there are some cultures or there are some things that maybe wouldn't go very well with our culture. And she adamantly disagreed with me and kind of shut me down and didn't want to have a conversation about that and share with her different parts of different cultures that in our country, freedom of speech and those things wouldn't go with what they believe. And so I said, yeah, you can be inclusive, but you also need to assimilate to the culture here in order to be successful. Uh, she didn't like that. She didn't like the word assimilate. She didn't, she had a presentation that said American culture in quotes. And so she wanted to know what I meant by American culture, which I explained to her was Bill of Rights, Constitution, free speech, freedom of religion. That's what I thought of as American culture. The second presenter, that was the end of that one. She didn't answer my questions, shut me down, said she would talk to me after, did not. The second presenter wanted to talk about unconscious bias. I did a little research on that before the presentation because I wanted to be informed. Uh, what I learned from doing research is that after 20 years of unconscious bias study, there's still no scientific proof that it has any impact on your behavior. So the idea is, I understand that unconscious bias exists, I understand that bias exists, but with unconscious bias, they're trying to tell me that I I don't know it exists. So they're trying to prove an unknown. And they're trying to say that it dictates my behavior. To me, that's kind of disturbing because that's a slippery slope of if I do something that you disagree with, you can accuse me of having unconscious bias and I can't tell you you're wrong because I can't prove it. So I, I questioned this gentleman at the beginning and told him that I had done some research and then after 20 years, they still have no scientific proof that it, it's reliable, and he agreed with me, and then continued for an hour presenting unconscious bias using two studies from CNN, which were not scientific in any way, to try and prove that unconscious bias has an impact. So I had some issues with that. Uh, the third presenter, and last, uh, I wanted to discuss several things. I've got a few notes here. One was intersectionality, which in my opinion is a disaster. Intersectionality is where you look at individuals as pieces. You're black, you're female, you're gay, you're pieces. You're not a human being. And you use those pieces as excuses. So you're creating victims. So the idea is if something doesn't work out for you, it's because of this certain aspect of your character which I think is a terrible thing to teach people. Uh, the other part was uh, they wanted to talk about, or he brought up um, sexism, and he wanted to use the wage gap, and I'm running out of time, and I'm not gonna get it all in, but um, I didn't have points on the tip of my tongue at the time to dispute the wage gap. I've come up with a few since then, but the, uh, the last one, uh, let me get a couple of those in, one was the idea that's out there is that women get paid 70 cents or something like that on the dollar for men. They're getting paid less than men. But the problem with that is in a capitalist country, if that were true, lots of women would be hired because they would be cheaper labor versus hiring a man. So the, the employer would want to make as much profit as possible. In order to do that, he would hire the worker that he can pay the less. But that's not happening. That's not the case. The other argument is when you look at that average, it doesn't take into account all the variables, which are uh, education, experience, hours they put in at work, all Thank of that stuff. So Thank you. in summary, if I can, sorry, I will be very short. Uh, my experience with children in 15 years in dealing with data is that when I talk to children and look at their data individually, I find that uh, it's experiences specific to them that cause them to have trouble or to be successful. If you start looking at people as a whole using data, you're gonna miss the picture. And I say that because I think the county is looking at data as far as discipline goes to try and dictate that we have this cultural okay. competency training. Thank and I think that's the wrong thank way you. to look at it. Thank, thank you, you for Mr. Your time. Ross. That concludes public forum, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we'll move now to board forum. Uh, Ms. Self, District One. 
District 2, 3. Ebony didn't say anything about the kids from Lonsdale, so I will. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of them at Tremont that are doing, a, uh, I guess, sort of a field trip overnight. I'm not sure the details, but Gloria told me about it, so I just wanted to say I uh, hope those kids up there are having fun. I'm sure they are. I'll bet. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Horn? Ms. Babb? Well, I'll just say that I was very proud this weekend that um, West High School won the state championship in cross country and Farragut was the runner up. So in the whole state, we had the um, two of the teams from here and um, my daughter's actually here that was on the team. So that was really fun. Well, please stand up. Where are you? <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Ms. Babb. Ms. Babb? Mr. McMillan? Ms. Christie? All right. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.